Our song we're going to sing is one that is familiar to many of you. It's not in our Trinity hymnal. I'm, I'm surprised that it's not. But um, it's a great gospel song talking about salvation. And so we're going to stand and sing all four stanzas of At Calvary, okay? Hit it, sister. you for reminding us of your great love in this song at Calvary. And we thank you for the love that made it all happen and for the love that we know in our hearts and we experience daily. We thank you that you loved us way before we ever loved you and we couldn't love you without you giving us that love and we thank you for that. Oh, Lord, as we gather here this first Thursday in June, we want to give you praise for the way that you have taken us through these months together uh, on Thursday school. We thank you for the teaching, the fellowship, the singing. We thank you for the work of Pam Esch playing and Asher Pope up in the sound room, for those who helped to set things up. Lord, you've been good to us to keep fellowship and keeping us connected and keeping us in the word together as a community on Thursdays. So meet with us now, Lord, and may we be profitable students because you have given us your word and our hearts have been attentive to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Bob and his dear wife, Faith, you were in Colorado? Did you have a good time? Did you see any snow? Wow. Oh, just on the mountains. Well, we're glad that you were able to visit and have a good time. But we're also glad you're back and able to be with us. And so you come on up, Bob. And as Bob's coming up, just to let you know, um, senior stories, articles are down here. 
If you haven't picked one up on Steve Marion, there's some copies here, okay? Bob, good to see you back. It is good to be back. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, during the month of April, we went through the book of 2 John in this class, and then in the month of May, Faith and I were traveling. Uh, during most of the month, we were either traveling to and from Colorado or we were in Colorado. And now here we are back in June, and we're going to do 3 John. So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them to the book of 3 John. And as you're opening them, I'm going to tell you two things that, that happened uh, during that month when we were gone. You know, you can look at somebody and you kind of think, well, they look just the same as they did a month ago, but life has a way of changing you in a month. So two things. One is really simple, really, and it's just a, an example of God's governing all things in this world. Did you... Notice in early May that the I-40 bridge across the Mississippi between Tennessee and Arkansas was closed. And the reason it closed was because there was a big crack in the steel beam. Well, Faith and I crossed that bridge about a day and a half before they closed it. And I, and I tell you, when you looked at that crack and I thought, wow, I can't imagine anything well, maybe I can't imagine something, but there aren't many things I can imagine that would be much worse than plunging off of a bridge into the muddy Mississippi River. So we were very thankful uh, that we made it across. And really, God was so gracious that real, no one was injured. But if you saw that crack in that beam, wow, it was frightening. Well, that made me start thinking a little bit. Do we ever, do we frequently remember to thank God for his good dealings with us and just the protection that he gives us and the way he cares for us? Sometimes I think we just let those things slip by maybe and don't even notice. And then that got me thinking about something else. You know, when COVID was at its worst, weren't we all just praying virtually daily, Lord, please send us some relief. Please help these folks that are uh, down with COVID. You know, we were just praying fervently. And then COVID sort of drifted away. And I wonder if we remembered to thank the Lord for the relief that he gave us from COVID. And if we not only thanked him once, but if we continually thank him and give him praise for that great grace, which enabled these vaccines to be so effective. So I just, just something to think about. Um, now, the second thing I'm going to mention is tied more closely to the books of 2 John and 3 John. And it's also a little bit more complicated um, story. In both of these books, John talks about what a joy it is for children to be walking in the truth. In 2 John, he talks about the elect lady's children walking in the truth. In 3 John, he talks about his own children walking in the truth. And the way he says that is probably spiritual children rather than physical children. But he's saying what great joy it is for children to be walking in the truth. I am sure that nearly everyone in this room who has children, at some point, probably for much of your life, you'd committed your children to the Lord. And you said, Lord, do with them as you will. All we want is for them to serve you and for them to love you. They're yours. Do with them as you will. Well, we've always found that a pretty easy commitment to make. But here in the last little bit, we found that it might not be so easy at certain points in your life. I mentioned, I think, to you before we left that uh, our son-in-law was candidating in a church in Colorado. Guess what? The church called him. Guess what? They accepted the call. Guess what? They're moving to Colorado. <laughs> now, there's, there's a couple things about this that make it fairly difficult. First, this is the only one of our children that stayed in Charlotte. So now everybody's gone from Charlotte when, when they go. This, and this was a, this family, my, our son-in-law and our daughter and their kid, they were extremely close, basically daily contact. They live 10 minutes from us. We're together all the time. They have 
two daughters. One is 20, one is 18. So they're young adults. Well, we were intimately involved in their whole lives. In fact, Faith was very instrumental in homeschooling them. So virtually, I mean, there was hardly a day that we didn't see them. Now, surprisingly, and unplanned, I might add, about three years ago, they had a little boy. Whoa, that's surprising. And then they decided that it wouldn't be a good thing to uh, raise that little boy by himself, so they had a second child, a little girl, who's a little over a year old. Well, yikes. We thought we had access to babies for years to come, and suddenly they're going to be gone. Well, I can tell you, it's one thing for your adult children to leave and go somewhere to serve the Lord. It's even, it, 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 it's, it, even a different thing if you have children, grandchildren born a long way away, because we do have some that were born a long way away, and that, I mean, has a certain feel to it, but that's okay. You can kind of cope with that. But to take your children that are closest to you and you have seen daily for 20 years, and then to take the young adult girls who you've been part of their life every day, and then to take those babies that you just adore and to move all of them at one time, whoa, that's a challenge that we did not expect and has taken us a little bit by surprise. Now, we have a little piece, piece of calligraphy on one of the walls in our house, and the little piece of calligraphy takes a verse from John, John chapter 4. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. So, the question for us is, let's see if we can really live up to that now. If they, they're gone there to serve the Lord, are we sure that that brings us the greatest joy? Now, I know, in a, in a sense, when I make that, and, and we heard some of the prayer requests that were mentioned, in a sense, you know, that's a, it's pretty light what, what we're having to face compared to what some of you may be having to face. But the thing about it is God doesn't hesitate to bring the unexpected into our lives, whatever our age. I, it's surprising, really, sometimes that it happens that way. But God doesn't hesitate to do that. The question becomes, how do we respond when he does it? How are we going to respond? So for us, the challenge is, are we going to rejoice in their departure? For them, the challenge is, well, they have to finish the sale of their house. They have to pack up all their stuff. They have to go to Colorado. And Rob's supposed to begin preaching on June 20th. So it's all going to happen within like two weeks or something like that. So... It's an interesting challenge uh, to see how all this is going to transpire. So if you happen to think about it, uh, I'm sure that they would appreciate your prayers in that, in that great endeavor. Uh, but we're here to read, look at 3 John. So we'll move to that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read 3 John in its entirety. Um, and as I read it, I would like for you to imagine perhaps that this letter is sent to you and you're reading it. And I would like to, for you to think big picture. Why was this letter written to this man named Gaius? Just kind of an overview of it. Why was it written? So think about that as I read it and follow along. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for those brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church by Diotrephes, 
who likes to put himself first does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want, uh, who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whatever does good is from God. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also had our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, every one of them. So here we are in this little book of 3 John. And you'll see that it begins in the usual format of these first century letters. The person writing it is identified, the elder. elder. And you will remember uh, from our study of 2 John, if you were here, that for purposes of our class, there's a discussion that can be had, but for purposes of our class, we take the position that the beloved disciple, John, is the writer of this book. Uh, and you say, why is he called the elder? First, because he's old. He's, this is late first century that this is written. He's old. He's probably an elder in the church of Ephesus. And he is the elder as opposed to an elder. Because if you think about it, John walked the earth with Jesus. He was there at the beginnings of the church uh, in the book of Acts. He worked his way through it. And now as he comes into his old age, he's still active in the church. And so he is the elder. Now, John is writing to Gaius. Uh, John calls him beloved. This is repeated three times in the book in verses 2, 5, and 11. So it's 1, 2, 5, and 11 where that phrase beloved is, uh, is, is in the book. The, New, the uh, New International Version Bible, rather than using the word beloved, uses the word dear friend. Now, both terms, beloved or dear friend, they convey some similar meanings. But to me, beloved is not quite so personal. I, I suspect that when I read that word beloved, you probably just kind of glossed over it. and didn't really think what it was meaning. But when you read that as dear friend, it is much more personal and it's much more uh, lively in general and brings life to the book as a whole. So as we think about this, we'll, we'll certainly use the word beloved, but we're also going to think of Gaius as being John's dear friend. So this letter has been written to the dear friend Gaius. Now, I asked you a few minutes ago to think about why this book was written as I read it. And perhaps you were able to come up with some ideas. I hope you were able to think of, well, yeah, I can see why that was written and have an idea as to why it is. I'd suggest to you two reasons that this book was written. First, I believe it was written to encourage Gaius. There are times that the Christian life can get a little difficult. You can wonder if you're on the right track. You can wonder if it's worth the effort, especially when things are going wrong around you or you see things that you think, that's just not right. It, sometimes you just get down and discouraged. And then a word of encouragement might come from a dear friend. And if that dear friend is a spiritual leader, it's even more helpful. And so that's part of what Gaius is receiving here. His dear friend, John, the elder, has written this. And as we'll see as we go down through it, he's encouraging Gaius in these good deeds that he's doing. Second, I believe it was written to warn Gaius of a danger in the church. It's sad to say, but sometimes people get into leadership positions in the church and they're not really very spiritually minded. Sometimes I think it takes us by surprise how many bad leaders actually come to power in the church. I'm not sure it should take us by surprise, 
If you just think of the depravity of man and the love of power and the love of prestige, but it does take us by surprise. And when that happens, it puts all the people in the congregation, all the people in the body of Christ in a difficult situation because we know, according to Hebrews 13, that we, the congregation, the body of Christ, we're to obey and honor those who are watching over our souls. But what happens when they start leading us in the wrong direction? What happens? What happens if they encourage us to do wrong? We're going to see, before we get to the end of this book, a leader in the church who actually does that. And we're going to see John's advice to Gaius. And the advice might surprise us a little bit, I think. Uh, but he's going to help Gaius to deal with the situation. And hopefully, as we read that and study it, we might find out some things that will help us if we ever get in a difficult situation like that. So John tells his dear friend how to react in this book. So, from my perspective, the two reasons that it's written, one is to encourage Gaius, the second is to warn Gaius. Now, we come to the uh, next phrase in verse 1, and it tells us of John's feelings towards Gaius, whom I love in truth, he says. When we were going through 2 John, we spent a lot of time talking about love and truth. We're not going to rehash all the things that we had to say in 2 John. Uh, I would just remind you of something here. When he says, whom I love in truth, that truth isn't just fact, uh, I guess is what I would say. It isn't, you know, like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's not the kind of truth that he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual truth. He's talking about the spiritual truth found in the full understanding of who Jesus is and what it means to follow Jesus. And perhaps, and, and we did this in 2 John, I'm going to do it again in this phrase, perhaps what helps us to see that a little bit is to change that word truth to Christ. And so the phrase would be, whom I love in Christ, because that's really what he's trying to, that's what he's saying, it's the truth, but it's the truth associated with a true understanding of Jesus. That's the truth in which he loves Gaius. So, we might ask then, to whom is John writing? Gaius. Who is Gaius? Mm, good question. There are about five Gaiuses in the New Testament. Gaius was a very common name back then. There are about five of them in different spots in the New Testament, and it doesn't appear that any of them are related to this one. It's, we don't know. So all we know about Gaius, actually, is what is written here. Now, there's a lot of insight given into Gaius, but as far as what his personal circumstances were, as far as what his actual role in the church was, as far as what his family consisted of, we don't know any of those things. And really, uh, there is no means uh, to speculate about it with any intelligence because there just isn't any information anywhere about Gaius. Now, you'll also notice that as John speaks like this, he doesn't seem to have any embarrassment about expressing his affection for Gaius. It's a good thing to have, and I just look, whom I love in the truth, beloved Gaius, I love in the truth, beloved. Over and over again, he mentions this. It is a good thing to have friends. It is a better thing to have good friends. It's a, the best thing to have good Christian friends who you can really be close to. Now, I think that it's appropriate, as John expresses his, his affection, I think it's appropriate for us to express our affection for those that are close to us. And I'm not saying that we need to go around saying, I love you, and every turn, or whatever. And I often think about this. We have three granddaughters, we have more than three granddaughters, but we have three that are particularly affectionate. They have hugged me and said that they love me more times. And in response, I hug them and say I love them too. I can tell you that it's happened more times with them than you could take everybody else in the world and I've never told them that I love them that much or hugged them that often. So, so there are people that that's just the way they are. They're very warm that way. 
I'm not saying that we have to go to that extreme, but I am saying that if we do have a good friend and we care deeply for them, it's a good thing to mention that from time to time. And if I remember correctly, and I might not, but I, if I remember correctly Mike Ross's sermons on the generations, I'm pretty sure that he said that it was our generation who was very hesitant to show or express affection. So I would say to you, you know what? We probably need to be very, to, we need to do that. And, and sometimes it doesn't take very much to encourage somebody. I, I was thinking about this. It happened many, many years ago. We were in a church, and I, it was a group that we were talking, and, and uh, as we were discussing friends and friendship and people we knew and that kind of thing, and I happened to make a comment. One of the per people in the group was named Don. And I made a comment. I said, you know, I've been friends with Don longer than I've known anybody else in the church. And I, I didn't really think. I just it was an observation. I wasn't really thinking about it that much, you know. But Don came back to me later, and he said, boy, he said, that really, that was, that was great. He said, that really encouraged me. I was so happy when you said that. And I thought, wow. You know, it doesn't take an expression of much, does it, to encourage somebody and uplift their spirits. So I just say to you, look at John. Boy, he's, he's, he says it a lot. We could do with probably saying it a little bit more. Now we come to verse 2, where this friendship is again emphasized. Beloved, or dear friend, as the NIV says, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Now, this might be, uh, this is an interesting prayer, I think. As you stop and contemplate this prayer, in some ways, it's perhaps a little backwards from what we would expect. We look at people walking around and in general good health and general prosperity, and we might say, oh, well, you know, I hope it's going as well with their soul as it's going with their body. But John does the reverse of that in Gaius's case. He is confident that Gaius's soul is prospering. And he says that he hopes Gaius's health and general prosperity match the prosperity of his soul. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, it wouldn't be bad for each of us to consider that for a moment. How about our lives? If people could see, is the prosperity of our soul greater than the prosperity of our body and, and, and just general well-being? Hopefully, in all cases, our soul is the example, is more prosperous. And I say that because really it's the soul that is of eternal value. So I hope that we, we reflect on that and, and consider our souls and the eternal value of our souls. Now, relating to this um, one commentator gives an interesting account of a medical doctor who noticed this verse and thought that, that maybe what he should do is he should use this verse as a reference, like when he signed his name. You know, he could just put this verse underneath it. But upon reflection, the doctor said this, as far as some friends were concerned, a prayer that their general health might match their spiritual prosperity could be interpreted as a prayer that they might require my professional services. <laughs> now, it doesn't say whether he actually went ahead and decided to adopt this or not, but I have a feeling that he didn't adopt that verse for, uh, as part of his signature. Uh, and I would say to you that perhaps part of the reason why John is saying this about Gaius is Gaius may have had some physical problems. He may have had some ailments that John is concerned about. And I want us to take a second and think about this relationship of the spiritual and the physical and our prayers. It's always legitimate for us to pray about the health or well-being of another person. It, it, it's legit. In fact, often it's the health concerns, isn't it, that triggers us to pray for somebody. I mean, so many times you don't even think about praying for somebody, and then you hear they have some kind of health issue, and that causes you to pray for them. But not too long ago, I was looking through my list of prayers, and, and I started dividing them up between the physical and the spiritual. 
And you know, I found an overweight on the side of the physical. I was praying for all the physical needs. And I thought, wow, maybe I ought to be praying more for the spiritual needs of people. Not neglecting praying for the physical needs, but praying at the same time for their spiritual needs. I know frequently we're praying for the whole person, but I just think that we would do well to, to remember to pray for their souls as well as their physical needs when we're praying for them. John prays for the physical, but his encouragement is found in the spiritual health of Gaius. John is confident that Gaius is spiritually healthy. And John finds that an encouragement. And again, I'm going to get back to this idea of praying for the physical and praying for the spiritual. You know, when you're praying, and, and again, boy, we heard some serious prayer requests and, and a different, and we need to pray for those people. But when you're praying for somebody's physical need and their life is just such a wreck that even when they recover, you're thinking, what's their life going to be like? I mean, it's just a disaster now. What's it going to be like when they recover? Is it going to be any better? It can be a little bit depressing when you, when you consider those kinds of situations. But here's the thing. When you pray for somebody who you are confident that their spiritual life is strong, isn't it a just, it's just a relief. It lifts your spirits. You look at them and you say, wow, yeah, they're having this physical problem now, but I'm not worried about their soul. The last 30 years, they've lived a consistent Christian life. And it just lifts our spirit when we see that. So I would say to you that we ought to strive, to strive to be those people. We might have physical needs. We might have other needs that somebody would request prayer for. But when they pray for us, hopefully they know. It's all right with their soul. They are living, they have lived, a consistent Christian life. That's what they ought to be thinking when they pray for us. Now, in verse 3, John briefly describes uh, how he's received this most recent update about the prosperity of Gaius's soul. Uh, verse 3, For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. So some brothers came and told John about Gaius. Do you remember back in 2 John? In 2 John, John says that he came upon, in some fashion, the children of the elect lady, and it seems like that's what triggered him to write that letter. Now, I, as I read 2 John and 3 John and think about the two of them together, I wonder if that could have been the same event that triggered the writing of both of these books. These letters are so similar in their format, in their wording, that it makes me think they must have been written about the same time or maybe at the very same time. If it was in our day and time, and I saw two letters this similar, I'd say it's probably one of two things. Either this guy's got a template set up in his computer and he's just kind of filling in the blanks on this template and send the letter, or it's a copy and paste and he's just changed the specifics in the second one. I mean, that's how similar they are in, in, in all these respects. Well, we know that that didn't happen uh, in the case of John writing these letters. So it just seems to me as you read them and study them and think about them, that they must have been written about the same time. And I wonder if it was the same event that triggered them. Now, this first phrase in this third verse, I find a little strange in the way that it's worded in the ESV. The brothers came and testified to your truth. Wait a second. They came and testified to your truth. What in the world? I, what does that mean? Well, if you look at other uh, translations, it's interesting how they handle them. Uh, the NIV, for example, that, uh, they add the word faithfulness. So it becomes your faithfulness to the truth. Well, I'm not sure that that word faithfulness is completely justified in being added, but, but it does help to understand in a sense. The New King James does something a little different. The New King James says truth that is in you and that, that that is is in italics which means that they're showing you that they've added that phrase 
the truth that is in you is what that says. Now, the old New American Standard Bible has a little bit different. It uses that is also, but it puts it in a different place. Here's the way it says it. Brethren came and bore witness to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. Now, see, that makes sense to me. And actually, I think that's probably what the ESV translators were getting at, but I'm not sure that they quite accomplished it as clearly as what the NASB did, the old NASB. Uh, Brethren came and bore witness to your truth. That is how you are walking in truth. One commentator explained the verse like this. Gaius had obviously heard the truth of the gospel and had received it wholeheartedly with the result that the truth was now in him and was causing him to pursue vigorously that way of life which the truth indicated. So with all that being said, how we translate that verse, all you know, the phrasing is unusual, whatever, here's what we want to get out of it for sure. We want to understand Gaius understood the truth and lived according to it. Gaius was a consistent, faithful Christian. Someone may say that, that he understands or she understands the truth of Christianity, but do they live that consistent life? Are they consistent in Bible reading and prayer? Consistent in church attendance? Consistent in resisting sin? Consistent in kindness? Consistent in giving help where needed. Consistent in faithfully following Christ. That's what John's saying about Gaius. That's the kind of person what Gaius was. Wasn't perfect, but he was consistent in his walk with Christ. John continues then in verse 4, the verse I've already mentioned, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And, of course, when John says this, we believe it's his spiritual children, not physical children. And we've already talked about, when we were going through 2 John, the great joy that comes about when children are walking in the truth, whether they're our children or friends' children or whoever they are. It just brings us great joy. Now, there is a vast difference between knowing the truth and walking in the truth. And I would put it this way, not much brings greater joy than when we hear of a child that knows the truth and walks in the truth. On the other hand, not much brings greater sadness than we say that child knows the truth but does not walk in the truth. That is a very sad moment when we say that. And it gets back to the book of James, faith without works is dead. The demons believe and tremble, right? But what good does it do them? And that's, that's the difference between knowing the truth and walking in the truth, living the truth. That's what we see. Uh, I'm trying to decide. Well, let, let me... Let me explore a little bit this verse 5. Uh, beloved or dear friend, it's a faithful thing you do in all your effort for these brothers, strangers as they are. Once again, John identifies Gaius as a friend, and then a, John assures him that he, the things he's doing are the faithful things. Now, one of the reasons I hesitate to get into this is because... Um, This is, a, this is a convicting verse in many respects. I mean, it's simple, it's short, but it's a faithful thing you do in all your effort for these brothers. Gaius puts forth much effort in supporting the brothers, even though they were strangers. They were traveling teachers and preachers, and, and you know the story how it was in the early church. A strong church would send out teachers or preachers uh, to go around and, and perhaps they uh, 
attempted to reach the unreached and to teach the untaught. But they were going around to at various communities and, and they were trying to spread the truth of the gospel. They were trying to spread the kingdom of God. And they didn't accept help from unbelievers, as we'll see in a little bit, so it was up to the believers to help them on their way. Now, we don't know much about Gaius, as I said before. We don't know, for all we know, Gaius was the wealthiest guy in his city and he had a mansion with hundreds of rooms and he had servants that took care of every room and it was no effort at all for him to take care of these traveling people. That could have been the case, but it doesn't sound like it when it re you read this verse. It sounds much more like he was an ordinary person with an ordinary house and guess what? It took that ordinary amount of effort to show hospitality. Hosting guests takes a lot of effort. And one of the things about effort that I find is interesting is effort requires energy. Now, you might say that's pretty obvious. Well, where are we in our life? Let's just say that we're more on the more mature end of life, aren't we? So, do you have the energy that you had 30 years ago? Can you do the things you could do 30 years ago? I know I can't do them. So here we are, mature. Well, what do you think? Is the Lord just going to say, well, you know what? Ah, you, you did okay. Forget it. You don't have to do anything else. I don't think so. I think he still expects us to use our energy and our effort to serve him in whatever fashion he brings our way. Uh, it might mean that we have to say no to some things. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember. Sometimes no is the best word that you can have. It simplifies your life. It, it, it's amazing what a simple no will do for you. Now, I'm not saying use no all the time, but there are cases where you might have to say no to something. So that what that does is that allows you to do the other thing that's remaining that you believe you really should be doing. You can do it better. You can focus on it. You can have the time and the energy for it. I don't know how that works out in each individual life, but I would just suggest to you that it's worth considering using the word no on occasion so that it opens up opportunities maybe that we can handle a little bit better than if we just simply said yes uh, to everything. Um, and our, our time's gone for today, so I think I'll just stop at that point. Uh, a little bit more to talk about hospitality and a little bit more uh, to talk about effort and energy, but we'll just pick up with that verse uh, next week, Lord willing, and, and we'll, we'll continue and finish that thought and move on into the other things that Gaius did. But let me close with prayer now. Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us and your mercy. We're amazed, Lord, that you included us in your kingdom. Uh, how gracious you have been, how unexpected your grace is in each of our lives, how undeserved it is. Father, we pray that you would take your word and you would help us to live according to it. May we bring honor and glory to you with our lives. We pray for our family members scattered wherever they may be, Lord. We ask for your hand of blessing and protection upon them. May you draw them to yourself. May they walk with you. Thank you for your love and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.